Hello and welcome to today's event focusing on music, prevention and self-care as part of the York Festival of Ideas programme 2021. I'm Karen Burland and I'm a Professor of Applied Music Psychology at the University of Leeds and I'm also a co-director of the Music for Healthy Lives Research and Practice Network. I'm delighted to be chairing today's session and very pleased to welcome our speakers today, who you can all see on screen right now. Um, so today we have Anna Datari, Naomi Norton, Ava Boyna Horvitz and David Tyreen, who are here to talk to you throughout today's session and then will join us together for a panel discussion after they've each given their individual papers. So we're starting today with Anna Datari. Anna is a PhD candidate at the University of York, for which her research examines a rare task-specific neurological disorder affecting professional musicians, musicians' focal dystonia, from a holistic viewpoint. So, over to you, Anna. Looking forward to hearing what you've got to say today. Thank you very much. Um, and actually, today I'm going to talk about um, a bit broader um, topic which is uh, the psychosocial work environment of musicians and how does it differ from the general workforce. Um, this is a segment of what I'm actually exploring in my main research uh, in musicians focal dystonia but this is a slightly broader approach and I felt that this was a bit more appropriate for this uh, general discussion. So I'm going to introduce you a paper uh, a research study we'd done uh, two years ago with some Norwegian colleagues examining the work environment of musicians. So we know that musicians have a very unique workplace and very special demands. There are very specific physical demands playing an instrument for long hours. There are psychological demands like public exposure, uh, performance anxiety, and there are also psychosocial demands, which are very rarely examined um, in, apart from looking at very small groups of orchestras, very specific roles within uh, musicians. So the challenges musicians face are various and a lot. First of all, musicians um, tend to suffer from musculoskeletal injuries, depending on what sort of papers you look at and how you define musculoskeletal injuries these numbers can go up to 98% of uh, affected musicians throughout their lifetimes. So this is a very serious problem. There are hearing losses reported, uh, performance related or workplace related hearing loss in musicians. Um, also, um, they looked at mental health issues among musicians and found that depression and anxiety is uh, twice as, as prevalent among musicians than the general population. Also another paper looked at insomnia. Pe uh, musicians are more prevalent to have insomnia than the general population. So we have lots of all sorts of different problems musicians struggle with on an everyday basis. And our question was, what, um, where's the source, the origin of these different sort of challenges? 
And um, papers are looking at physical demand, the repetitive movement required to play an instrument, the non-organic nature of the instruments, like very twisted position. Uh, instruments will have to like stay for a long time and, and um, use only small muscle groups repeatedly. That can explain a lot of musculoskeletal injuries. Also, there are psychological factors uh, like the aforementioned public exposure and performance anxiety. But we were particularly interested in psychosocial factors. So psych psychosocial factors are basically um, defined as the intersection between the work environment and the individual's um, um, like personal, personal word. Um, and we were particularly interested in how the workplace can have an impact on the musician and in turn all these, on all these challenges. So in the general population, there's been excessive research carried out about a psychosocial environment, and it's been linked to all sorts of different physical problems like cardiovascular problems, musculoskeletal pain, especially back pain and mental health problems such as burnout and depression. And the literature shows in the general population that these problems are pretty much the ones which musicians in general struggle with even more than the general population. So it seemed like a logical step to actually look at musician psycho, uh, psychosocial work environment and just explore it a bit. How, how does it look like and how does it differ from the general workforce? So we had three main research questions. We wanted to look at musicians work environment. Uh, we looked at Norwegian musicians. That's where the study took place. So we looked at differences between musicians and the general populations. We were also interested in how the different roles and genres uh, being played have an impact on, on these outcomes. So like, does it, is it different from a classical musician to a pop or rock musician or jazz musician? And also we looked at the roles, whether someone is a soloist or playing in a small ensemble, a large ensemble. Um, and we were lucky enough to examine the data coming from 1,607 musicians. And we compared these musicians to 8,406 people from the general workforce. Our sample is, uh, you can see like some uh, data about our sample, like we have 1,016 females and the mean age was 44.5 years. And we measured the psychosocial work environment in the QPS Nordic scale. The specific scale was developed to measure psychosocial work environment from seven different viewpoints. How much control people have over the jobs, how, how the demands, the support they're receiving, how much they feel rewarded in terms of salary and acknowledgement, how much work and family conflict they have and how much motivation they have in their jobs. And um, here is some just uh, showing uh, you some more information about the sample. So in terms of genre, we had 47% classical musicians, which is still uh, the bulk of the, of the sample. But at the same time, I was delighted to see that we have all sorts of other different genre players. We have jazz players, pop, rock, folk, show music players. And we had even have 22% musicians who didn't identify any of these genres. So they play different kinds of music. So it's a very, um, very interesting sample to look at. In terms of roles, we had 18% of large orchestra players, sorry, uh, large orchestra players, 45% uh, 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 of like small ensembles, and 24% soloist in the sample. So I'd like to show you some of our results. Uh, when we compared musicians to the general workforce, what we found is that musicians reported more control over their work. But on the other hand, they reported less job motivation, less support received, less reward, both in terms of salary and in acknowledgement, more family and work conflict, and more demands than the general population. So this is obviously not a great uh, finding in terms of like musician psychosocial work environment. I just want to show you some examples how we compare these to different occupations. And here you can see that the, in the general population sample with that 8,000 people I mentioned, we had everything from skilled agriculture and forestry workers to uh, clerical support workers, technicians, managers, armed forces. So all sorts of different, different um, professions here. And you can see that this, is, um, uh, this table is looking at 
uh, means of support and musicians are deep down here. And when it comes to demands, all these other professions report much less demands in their work than musicians. Regarding the other two research questions, we really were interested in how this thing differs between different genres, like if you play classical, jazz, contemporary, pop, folk music, how does it differ? So we had two significant findings here. When it came to job control, we found that classical musicians reported the least job control, which makes a lot of sense because the material they're playing is much restricted and everything is prescribed. So if you think about like a big orchestra, um, the violinist even uh, put the bowing in so they look like a uniform from the outside. Everything is prescribed by the conductor seeing where and what tempos they want um, and they give instructions to the orchestra. So the individual musician doesn't have that much space to have a control over how they play. When it comes to job demands, contemporary music players uh, reported the most demands. Again, this is something which makes a lot of sense because people who primarily uh, perform contemporary music very often have new pieces composed. They do a first performance, they have another new piece composed. While a classical musician sits in orchestra might have a repertoire which keeps repeating to a certain extent. Also, contemporary music is known for its challenging techniques. So this also makes a lot of sense. When it comes to looking at different groups of musicians, um, again, job control was lowest in the large orchestra for probably the same reasons I already said in the previous slide about classical musicians. And when it comes to job support, and this is very interesting finding, solo on solo players or front figures reported the least support so they would require more support so we have this theory about um, traveling musicians who play with different orchestras different ensembles they don't have that social environment that orchestra that belonging so they would require much more support um, in their work so basically um this is an exploratory study in terms of we just like mapping out what is going on with musicians psychosocial work environment but the next step with this would be really looking at how these factors impact musicians mental and physical health the same way that these links were made in general population to all sorts of musculoskeletal injuries and all sorts of physical and mental problems it would be very interesting to see how these link to certain issues, which I raised in the first slide, musicians are suffering from. And the other, maybe even more important questions that which aspect can be changed and how? Because many of these issues, many of these things like the demand levels, the support system, the reward with salary, reward with acknowledgement, uh, could be fixed with the right kind of policies scheduling. Um, there are others which are obviously much harder to tackle, like job motivation, but there are certain things which could be very easily helped um, if there was enough information available. Um, so basically, the takeaway from this presentation, I guess, that the psychosocial work environment is not very favorable for musicians right now, and we really need to to change certain approaches, policies, and the way we think about musicians' psychosocial work environment in general to improve living conditions and working conditions for this vulnerable population. So these are my references, and I thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Yeah, that was an absolutely fascinating, um, really, really fascinating paper. So thank you so much. And some, some definite food for thought there, I think, as we go through the rest of the panel. And I think if it's OK with you, we'll leave questions and pick up some general threads uh, after we've heard the other speakers. Um, but thank you. A kind of virtual round of applause from those on the screen for Anna. Thank you ever so much. Great. OK, we're going to move on now. Um, and our next speakers are... Um, Eva Boyna Horvitz and David Tyrene. Um, Eva is Professor of Music and Health at the Royal College of Music in Stockholm and a researcher in the Department of Clinical Neuroscience, Karolinska Institute. Her research focuses on performance evaluations with musicians, music and health, music and end of life situations, music and social sustainability, music and public health, arts and humanities, music and learning, creative learning and flow. 
David Tyreen is a senior lecturer in musicology at the Royal College of Music in Stockholm and a researcher in the Department of Music Education and Music and Media Production. His research focuses on music history, music and media production, music and health, music and end of life situation, arts and humanities, and music and learning. So over to Eva and David for their presentation now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. And uh, we started to uh, share our screen here directly. We are sending from Stockholm, Sweden, from the Royal College of Music. And we would like to share with you how to take care of uh, musicians. I think that is also targeting uh, what you, Anna, introduced us with here today. And this is uh, uh, data from a published study. And we are trying to uh, inspire you all with some uh, data from this publication. So uh, we, will, we will start, I will introduce you, David. So what is this? Thank you, yes. Uh, I will start with giving you a sort of uh, historical background on creative work and uh, taking care of the musician. And this is the Beatles um, and they, went to India in 1968 on a retreat. They did a transcendental meditation. They wanted to get out of pressure. And uh, after the death of their former manager, Ben Epstein, they did try a new way. And they only brought acoustic guitars and they sang and they wrote great songs like Dear Prudence and so on. Later on, uh, the Beatles manager, Sir George Martin, started the Air Studios and he chose Montserrat in the Caribbean as a location for the studio. And in the 1980s, great music was being um, made in the, in the Montserrat studio of Air Studios by George Martin. Here you can see a picture of the Beatles in India. Uh, I would also like to mention the Compass Point Studios in the Bahamas, uh, great work like Avalon by Roxy Music and other great music was being made there in retreat. Uh, Richard Branson of Virgin Records um, created the manor outside of Oxford where musicians could um, live in retreat and, and work and record music. I have also visited Peter Gabriel Studios at Real World Studios just outside of Bath in Box in England and how he created music in this fantastic environment in an old mill which is being transformed into a music studio. Now you all know about ABBA, right? The Swedish phenomenon, ABBA. And uh, interestingly enough, you can see in this picture, they love to retreat in the archipelago of Stockholm here with the families. And um, they were really creative there in this environment uh, away from the limelight. And if you need to see the next slide, please, you can see Benny Andersson and Björn Elvius. Uh, they are creating music here at Vigse in the Stockholm archipelago. And all the great ABBA songs actually were written in this uh, small building here, using just an acoustic piano, acoustic guitar, and singing and humming melodies. Um, so that's songs like Dancing Queen, you know, Mamma Mia, all those songs were, recorded, were being uh, actually created here in this small uh, island out of, outside of the Stockholm archipelago. And uh, now I'd like to lead on to Eva, please. Thank you so much, David. So the question is, how do we support uh, musicians and how can we use retreats? Uh, so we have examined the use of a nature and an art related activity retreat, which was designed for musicians and researchers. And we evaluated uh, an international group of researchers experiences after the three day retreat with a follow up after three months. We did a focus group interview and there were three major important themes that I would like to explore and explain to you later. And uh, we also would like to discuss later on in the panel how we can systematize and organize those retreats together with you. So retreat programs are often used in rehabilitating patients, reducing employees burnout and stress increasing quality of life and improving educational and leadership abilities, but very little is known about the effectiveness of these activities. So when evaluating and explaining stress and its relation to restoration, theories such as attention restoration theory, perceived stress theories and psycho psych psychological stress theories, PSRT, have been used. 
And uh, to improve cognitive performance, uh, another factor is to measure and evaluate the contact with nature, but very, very few uh, references are found in the literature. So the natural environment can be more beneficial than the built environment. We have data on that in relation to human health and development, and that being outdoors seem to be positively associated with vitality. And studies have also shown that improved physiology, such as lower blood pressure and reduced stress levels in relation to the natural environment compared to urban environment. Those are also references that's, that we have found in the literature. But the aim with this specific study was to explain in what ways uh, a focused group program uh, used nature and art related activities for research as musicians in a natural setting uh, in how, how that could be beneficial and research questions such as how do we organize this? How do we as researchers perceive and communicate this retreat? And which health factors do we find meaningful and important regarding taking care of ourselves uh, as researchers and musicians? And we also did this in three months to see uh, the follow-up uh, data there. So the art uh, practices selected for this specific retreat included singing, yoga, expressive writing, expressive movement, dance, drawing, drumming, culture-specific expression, and nutrition. And all the workshops, they were approximately one and a half hour long and scheduled at a specific time on the retreat agenda during those three days and that the entire group took part in each other's uh, workshops and we did them together. So here you see the different workshops again, and you can also read about them more specifically in our publication. And when it comes to the results, uh, there were three specific themes uh, that was found. It, it was about sharing and connecting to each others. It was about embodiment and also the nature how nature affected the participants here. So when it comes to the results also, the workshop experience as the most useful one for the yoga and the mindful eating workshop. And as for the meaningfulness factor, the workshops experience as the most meaningful were the nature-based dance and the self-figure drawing and the dance workshop. I think we'd like to discuss this later on in the panel also. But how and with what vocabularies are the themes of well-being discussed in the material among the retreat participants. So two of the most prominent themes in the material were sharing and connecting. And the theme of embodiment was significantly more prominent in the material than the themes of spirituality, spiritual growth, self-expression, for example. So when we look deeper into the sharing and connecting then, may be interpreted as a driving force for authenticity and vulnerability where age, titles and background didn't have any influence at all. And in comparison with the previous healthcare packages with artistic activities taking place indoors, those activities used in this study seem to evoke a deeper sense of sharing and connection among the participants. So embodiment was also also linked with nature in the text. And I hear I quote, being part of the nature and through that connection, the participants were also able to better listen to themselves. And the brain modality specific systems are constituted by a combination of different processes such as the sensory system, which regulate perception, the motor system, which trigger actions, and the introspective system, which govern conscious experiences of emotion and cognition. And as Damasio puts this, we feel, therefore we learn. I think that is also related to the success factors that David earlier presented with other retreats. Uh, and I think we need to mention also the Fibonacci fractal di dimension, uh, the so-called the golden ratio. So the qualitative nature of the natural environment could have evoked a sense of meaning through this golden ratio presented in the literature. And it helped us to feel safe and to feel meaningfulness from the repetition of fractals seen in the nature, natural patterns to which we automatically uh, attach our gaze. So this could also be seen as an important contributor to the trustful sharing that was seen during the retreat. Uh, another thing is about wakefully relaxed 
So a wakeful relaxed state is presented as a factor in the literature on nature-based activities can be evaluated from brain signals when perceiving fractal patterns from nature. So this wakefully relaxed state seemed to be an interesting one to relate to the openness and the compassionate mindset reported between the participants during the retreat. So this state is interpreted as part of the clarity of mind that was described as being shared by the participants and as linked to the relaxed social climate seen in the results of the content analysis, which also may be uh, an interesting point when it comes to creative creativity. Uh, so tuning into pr primitive parts in nature, we cannot maintain our facades. Nature presents us with contrast to our urban academic lives. It can be upside down, unstructured, not designed, not owned, etc. So we would argue here that it is essential that retreat interventions are nature-based in order to well, so we are able to tune in to the primitive parts of ourselves. So this tuning in is also a theme in the interview analysis. So the participants did not talk about their physical health and effects. This was not the focus, even though the explicit purpose of the retreat was to take care of the researcher. So the importance of sharing a workshop that had previously been embodied by one of the researchers participating may also have played a part in establishing intimacy and trust. So letting each participant contribute and with an activity, it could be a key to success in this intervention. So in the conclusion, there has been insufficient study about ways the primary research instrument, the person who generates and studies hypothesis can be supported, important for musicians. And finding point, findings point to ideas when nature could be incorporated in selected intensive and intellectual persons, such as inaugurating courses and orienting research communities in space. So a featured finding is that a nature-based retreat fosters trust and creative space to engage common purpose and individual ingenuity was found. So sharing natural space was felt by the participants to put humanity into perspective, connecting with the social goals of research. So I think this is a key finding about the uh, humanity into perspective here. And we are uh, collaborating and uh, organizing and systematizing health preventive intervention and retreats for researchers, musicians and academia is an important part of the sustainable academic and music community. And we need to be better taken care of in a more embodied way. Although this study was conducted prior to COVID-19, such retreats and potentially also online versions could be useful for managing through the pandemic and afterwards in our new normal. So this was a collaboration with the a publication with Georgetown University, Turku University of Applied Sciences in Finland, Karolinska Institute here in Stockholm, and Royal College of Music here in Stockholm. And um, thank you very much. And we will, uh, well, we will look forward to, to debate uh, different themes here later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Another virtual round of applause uh, for Eva and David there. A really uh, thought provoking, um, something I've not actually thought terribly much about myself, you know, in terms of when we think about this kind of topic that we're talking about today. And lots of ideas currently kind of spinning around my head that I'm, I can't wait to discuss with you shortly um, after Naomi's um, presentation. So thank you once again for another uh, really stimulating talk. Thank you. Okay. So we're gonna move on now to our final speaker um, of this panel. Um, so I am very pleased to welcome Naomi Norton, who's an associate lecturer in music education at the University of York, uh, and also a freelance musician with a varied portfolio that includes teaching, research, consultancy, and performance. The driving force behind her diverse professional activities is the belief that no one should be denied the opportunity to progress to the level of musical proficiency that they desire. Over to you, Naomi. Thank you very much and hello everyone. So I'm going to share with you some thoughts, um, but not some slides uh, that are relating to the health and wellness of musicians. And these draw on my professional experiences in this area as a researcher, teacher and consultant. Uh, in particular, 
I'll be referring to my journal article, Considering Musicians Health and Wellness Literature Through the Lens of the Behaviour Change Wheel, which was published in the Journal of Music, Health and Wellbeing last year. There's a wonderful quotation from a researcher called Heine Gembris um, that sums up quite a lot of what we're talking about today. It's from the book, Music, Health and Wellbeing, in which Gembris states that there must be a balance between health as a resource for making music and making music as a resource for health. Now, often when I share my interest in musicians' health and wellness, the response is something along the lines of, oh, you mean music therapy? i.e. using music as a resource for health. And I then have to explain that, though that is a very worthy pursuit, it's not what I focus on. I'm interested in the health and wellness of musicians of all ages, abilities, aspirations, and activities. So not just performers, but teachers, composers, conductors, audio engineers, um, and so on, very diverse roles in music. Now, a few years ago, I would have presented what I focus on as the, the negative side of the music health and well-being coin, because whereas engagement with music can have many overwhelmingly positive effects for the general population, being a musician can have profoundly negative outcomes in terms of physical, psychological and social health and wellness, as we've already heard very um, nicely explained by Anna. But in line with a general shift within the discipline and an update in my own thinking, I now conceptualize my work much more positively as focusing on enabling everyone who takes part in music to do so without encountering insurmountable barriers relating to their health and wellness, and also finding ways of equipping them with the skills needed to overcome the minor barriers that we encounter along the way. First and foremost, musicians are people, so their health and wellness is a worthy focus in relation to their daily lives. I don't need an excuse to think about a musician's health and to care about it. That said, the health and wellness of musicians also has profound implications in terms of what they produce, whether that is a concert or a gig that lifts audience members' spirits or facilitating a young person's mastery of a new skill a recorded piece that we put on to brighten our days and motivate our activities, or a music therapy or community music session with any number of client groups, live music played in hospitals, and any other number of ways within which music is embedded within our lives. And in each of those situations, there is a musician, or in most cases, many musicians who have been involved in the creation of the musical outcome or product. And as we've already heard from Anna and, and, and Eva and David, the, the context in which musicians undertake their activities affects their health and wellness. And this echoes insights from behaviour change experts and models such as the behaviour change wheel by Professor Susan Mickey, which is spelled M-I-C-H-I-E, and colleagues at University College London. In 2019, I reviewed the abstracts of all papers published in the journal Medical Problems of Performing Artists between 2000 and 2019. And I located 49 music related articles that investigate the effects of a particular behavioural intervention for musicians health and wellness. And I then coded these papers by matching each study's primary focus to the domains of the COMB model which is a model explaining how our behaviours influence and are influenced by our physical and psychological capability, our physical and social opportunity, and automatic and reflective motivation. So C-O-M affecting B for behaviour. And the vast majority of the papers that I reviewed focused on making changes to individuals' physical and psychological capability i.e. trying to ensure that they know how to be healthy and can follow the motions needed for healthy activity in their chosen musical discipline, whatever that may be. In my paper, I've provided an overview of the many and varied ways in which specialists have helped musicians to develop their capability through educational sessions, training, exercise programmes, movement optimization, pharmacological support or surgery. And while these improvements in musicians' capabilities are necessary in some cases, 
they're also clearly not sufficient because we've not seen magical reductions in the prevalence and incidence of health concerns among musicians. Once again, insights from health psychology and behavior change provide potential explanations. As Kelly and Barker explain in a paper entitled, why is changing health related behavior so difficult? Making healthy choices is not just common sense because knowledge and information do not drive behavior. And people may sometimes be rational, but they are also seemingly sometimes irrational because the effects of environment and motivation cannot be underestimated. At present, musicians' environments are often not conducive to enabling them to make healthy choices. This has been already been recognised by the panel today, but also by a few intervention de designers who have focused on making changes to physical environments, for example, by changing the interface between performing musicians and their instruments. As a violinist, for me, it might be the chin rest and shoulder rest. Um, by considering the physical characteristics of musical environments, often in relation to hearing health, and also the availability of healthcare by organisations such as the British Association for Performing Arts Medicine. In contrast, very few researchers have focused on social opportunity in their interventions, but they have made recommendations relating to the role of parents, teachers, peers and colleagues, the effects of musicians' lifestyles, religions and working locations, and the influence of genre and musical activity, particularly in re relation to the venues in which music takes place. Finally, the least commonly stated focus of interventions aimed at enhancing musicians' health and wellness was motivation, which is a shame because it is one of the most profound influences on our behaviours. And this has been recognised by researchers investigating conditions such as music performance anxiety, where they acknowledge the role of goal orientation and perfectionism as potentially positive or negative motivational influences. Actively changing motivation is hard, as I'm sure we all know, but once again, there are models and insights from health psychology and behavior change that can help. So hopefully we will see more approaches focusing on motivation in the future. So how does this all relate to our current focus on music prevention and self-care? Well, as I've been listening to the other speakers, I've already been seeing some of these connections, but I'll just summarize by saying that by bringing together the insights that we have from musicians' health and wellness and performing arts medicine with that from other disciplines like behavior change and health psychology, we can see that to enable musicians to continue producing musical outcomes that are used for health, we need to prevent them from encountering health-related barriers. And to do that, we need to think about them not just as individuals, but as members of musical cultures. We need to create physical and social spaces that support health and wellness and help musicians to develop the motivation needed to use their physical and psychological capability, which many of them already have, to make those healthy choices. And I say we there because this is an effort that needs to involve everyone. So music education, which I would define as the process by which someone learns to be a musician, and there are many ways of doing that. Music education has a huge role to play. All, all musicians are in some way music educators because we're all role models for others and members and co-creators of musical cultures. So encouraging all musicians, which for me includes performers, teachers, music therapists, community musicians, conductors, composers, and, and, and everyone, enabling musicians to engage in self-care is a vital part of moving forward into a healthier musical future for everyone. In addition, those who work with musicians in any context, including music for health environments, need to ensure that their horizons are broad enough to consider not just the health and wellness of those that their intervention focuses on, but also that of the musicians involved in facilitating it. And such an approach we would presume would, would um, support the intervention outcomes by showing that health is not just preached, but also practiced. And finally, all members of the public who engage with music could consider that in doing so, they are also engaging with musicians. Thinking of the people behind the product may encourage healthier relationships between audience members and performers, between parents and pupils and teachers, between music consumers and businesses promoting music consumption and the musicians whose work is being consumed, 
or between policymakers in government and those representing musicians and the musicians that are being represented. Music and the arts support us in our darkest moments, as we've seen repeatedly in the last 18 months. And they are also with us in our greatest moments of triumph and success. So within the field of music, health and well-being, I think we really need to seek that balance between music as a resource for health and health as a resource for music making. Um, so thank you very much for listening to my thoughts and I'm very much looking forward to discussing them with the other members of the panel. Great, thanks so much Naomi and another round of applause for another really engaging and thoughtful presentation. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers. I'd like to welcome another person uh, to our little community here. Um, so uh, you will see on your screens, um, Karen Bloor. Uh, Karen's a professor of health economics for policy at the University of York and the university's research champion for health and wellbeing. And Karen's joining us um, for the panel discussion today as well. So um, I've been thinking about where I wanted to start the discussion and I wondered whether from each of your perspectives a nice place to, to start would be to pick up on that point that Naomi's just been talking about which is the enabling self-care and what that might look like. So I wondered whether any of you have got any kind of thoughts or suggestions about what what we, and I'm not quite sure who that we is, so I'd be interested to hear about that. Um, what might enable self-care? What are the factors that we should be searching for or, or asking for? So would anyone like to, to, to start us off? I think it's important to start to uh, recognize the body and to start to also recognize the warning or pre-warning signals from the body when something is not in order. And uh, there are a lot of self-awareness programs out there. And we are also trying to train our musicians here in Stockholm to, to be more aware of uh, their physicality. Even though that is something sometimes hard because they're more focused to take care of the instrument rather than taking care of the bodies. So I think this is a good start to start with the awareness, embodied awareness, uh, and there are tools for that. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm not sure how much a feature of musicians education that is actually necessarily. Any other thoughts or comments? I mean, do you just kind of chip in as you see? Yeah. The Healthy Conservatoire Network pops into mind. It's, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the Royal College of Music, the Royal Northern College of Music and other conservatoires are actively aiming to include um, health related, you know, materials knowledge into their curriculum and also make it more available and just as a like personal experience I did my master in performance in Budapest Hungary and then when I came to London and did another master's at the Royal College of Music I was amazed that mental health services were available for free for five sessions this was something which is absolutely unheard of you might have heard that well you need to seek help but opposing my original experience my first MA it was available in London if I really wanted to do so and they took steps to make gym available like actually create a gym space where people can, can move so I really feel that apart from just of course preaching health talking about the importance of the body just actively creating opportunities for the students and you know something which is easily accessible like a gym space within the conservatoire so they can just go down between the practice session and just like run on the treadmill or do something because knowledge in itself is not enough facilities and then opportunities need to be created and i would really underline the importance of like starting this very early on in the, in the education and not start when it's already too late as eva mentioned that when you already start having that tendonitis it's like two years too wait to start working on and taking care of your body. Yeah, and I think that's a really important distinction to make, isn't it? There's the kind of advice and there's the giving information, but then there's actually kind of fostering active engagement in those recommendations and, and providing an infrastructure in which that can be enacted. Yeah, really important points, Anna. Yeah, anyone else want to kind of comment on that? Karen, yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm 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 not a musician. I, I have no particularly specialist knowledge in music, but um, I'm I'm interested in some of the parallels um, here between 
what we know in general about about how to be healthy and, and as you say knowledge isn't isn't always enough we all know you know what what the recommended drinking levels are and we know that we shouldn't smoke and we know that we shouldn't eat sugar and you know these, these aren't you know and we know that we should move around more which is which is perhaps the biggest um risk factor i think sort of sedentary lifestyle um, and, and I suppose that's the one I was thinking about, particularly with regard to musicians at the moment, is that if you're in a rehearsal hall, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I've been there for hours and hours and hours and, and I'm, I'm a very, very amateur musician. But, but you know, you can spend a very long time um, essentially sitting, playing, um, playing music and waiting for things to happen. Um, the, there must be a lot of... Um, sedentariness in 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 musicians lives um i'm i'm guessing um so um I, I like um i like anna um and and ava's ideas around around how that happens um but i'd like to i'd like to get i'd like to encourage um people to to think outdoors not not rather than the gym really so so going back to ava's um suggestions of being in nature i think um you know don't run on a treadmill, run run outdoors um, or, or walk outdoors and ideally somewhere green. Um, and I think some of these um, lessons from, from just general public health uh, measures um, are, are, are really important. But, but as Naomi was saying, knowledge isn't enough. We need to sort of make it easy for people. Um, and, and the easier it can be to do that, the better. And I don't know, I, I, I'm, again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a musician, so I don't know how these um, sessions work, but, but can, can these kind of breaks and active breaks be introduced more into musicians' lives? So you don't have to go away for a fortnight's retreat, but actually in your everyday working life as a musician, um, can, we, can we encourage um, and enable um, more activity and ideally more activity outdoors. That was certainly something I've picked up on actually as we were we were listening and it was from listening to what Anna shared with us it, it, it becomes obvious I, I think to people as to why people might need to retreat from that environment and to go somewhere to reset but I'd be really interested to see whether the outcomes of, of Eva and David's you know, research and, and, and Anna's can, can be brought together to say, well, instead of it, well, retreats are valuable for those people who, who need that intense treatment. Um, but can it be brought back into the workplace so that those lessons are not at the treatments end, uh, but are brought into that primary prevention sphere? so that the environment which which we really are seeing is, is the biggest influence um can can be made better i having worked in this this um discipline i often hear people finishing educational sessions and the musicians have, have really got it they've, they've really engaged they're, they're feeling very capable of the particular outcomes that were being prioritized in that session and then a few weeks later they say but I can't do this. You know, I, I'm not continuing these behaviours that I know are healthy because the environment just doesn't support it. And that, I think, for me, really hammers home what I think is a key theme here, which is that psychosocial work environment needs a lot of work for musicians. <laughs> also, I would like to add that um, at our school in Stockholm, many of our young students, they are like working in like bedroom producers, they are sitting in their flat or apartment, working in a small room with a computer, creating music, and they are just absorbed into that small, tiny space, you know, and they don't really go out in the nature or doing a retreat or something like that. So that's why we are sort of focusing on this research also for students at uh, Royal College of Music in Stockholm. And another question was quite surprising me when we asked about how do you know that you take care of yourself and it's quite hard to answer that question because we are so different we need a lot of different tools we need to look at this um, i mean the emotional body and the cognitive and the sensitive and the uh, motor part of the body and and uh, we, we have different needs so i think this idea 
to use the micro format of a retreat into sort of micro format and to use it like every day and, 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 and put it into as you so interesting Naomi uh, showed this behavior, how, how it can be very difficult to change a behavior, but we need to support this sort of every day and to uh, nudge it, uh, we call, we, we do it together with something else. So the, the challenge here for our students right now is to be more aware of, well, to answer the question, how do you know that you take care of yourself? And when you have answered the answer to that, we, we can also uh, try to uh, uh, develop this, uh, as we say, smorgasbord, this different smorgasbord, smorgasbord of uh, tools and to, to also uh, add it into the curricula of their uh, everyday life here at the campus. Mm -hmm. Anna? Can I just add to that? We just keep circling back to this idea of motivation that of course we need to make it available. It needs to be micro things so they can put it into everyday schedules, but how do they get actually motivated to it every day? And then from my own perspective and from many students perspective, I've been coaching and teaching. Um, I think that the biggest motivation of any music student who wants to become a professional musician is to be better at their instrument. So I found it super important to link these things if you do this, you're going to be better at playing the violin. If you take care of your body, if you sleep better, if you eat better, if you do these things, these small things we already mentioned, engaging with nature, exercise, micro retreats, big retreats, all these things. So if we can link the motivation together with their actual real huge motivation to become the best, because why do you, you know, when you become a professional musician, they go ahead and practice eight hours a day because in your head, that's what's going to make you great. Practice more and practice more. And that's also the message coming from music educators, which is a whole different topic again. But if you, if you get this information that, okay, so if you take care of this and this and this, you're going to be better at your instrument might be a, like link these things to the underlying motivation of these students um, when it, when talking about like professional musicians, because I know for myself that was my only motivation um, until I finished my MA to become the very best flutist ever. So maybe that could be um, a sort of idea solution. I wonder if there's something. Oh, sorry, go on, Amy. That's right. I'm just going to jump in there because um, you've picked up that you know the music education role, and as a lecturer in music education, I feel like I need to highlight that that is so true. Um, and for me, this is about there is so much focus on performing musicians within this discipline, you know, about the health of performers and about teaching performers about this. And I'm just gonna take that back a step and say, actually, how can we have the biggest influence on musical cultures? By teaching a performer, you teach a performer and they are really valuable and they may well then influence their network of peers. They may also teach, so they may teach others. Who is setting the environment? Who is actually setting the rehearsal schedule? Who is creating the university um, you know, courses? Um, who is recording these, these musicians in the studio? And you know, the, the inclusion of this at conservatoires who are generally more, more performance focused um, as a general rule, and I know that you know, that is um, changing slightly, but that's great. But actually it should be included for all musicians because all of those musicians who go out into the world and take on other really interesting varied roles within the musical culture are very likely to have a profound influence on more than just themselves. I think there's something here that actually these the kinds of things that we seem to be talking about here are beneficial to everybody so it's not just beneficial to musicians there are added benefits for the musicians but actually we know that our nation's young people are really struggling at the moment. You know, mental health issues for you know young adults in particular, which is you know who we're primarily talking about here. Although I know we need to talk about younger people as well, actually. Um, but I, you know, this this could have broad-reaching benefits for everybody, but will also benefit the musicians if you're thinking about the diversity of student interests in the music department. The other thing that I was wondering about is, of course, there's an aspect of the individual's personal drive to do this, which I think can lead to unhealthy behaviors. You know, musicians identify very strongly with their craft, you know, regardless that whether they're a composer or an engineer or a, you know, a performer, actually they identify very strongly with that. And it can be difficult to accept 
that there might be something going on that they need to address, whether that's a kind of psychological resilience or it's a physical uh, problem. And I wondered if you've got any reflections on that from your research or your experience. Yeah, so you're bringing in the word sustainability here. And of course, uh, we are all trying uh, to work with the Agenda 2030 with all our students. Uh, but still, it's not about uh, the sustainable development goals. Uh, it's their inner development goals. And yeah. how can we translate the Agenda 2030 and also talk about more the inner mental goals? Uh, but <clears throat> I think it's, it's a key thing now. In our findings, we have heard in interviews that the sound from the instrument is much clearer and much more professional if you take care of your body before. So if we just try also to publish more of those results when we interlink the body into the societal body and the sustainable part, the, the trip that we start early on. And, and of course, all of our musicians, they start very early, uh, but also they want to um, get motivation from uh, the outside, the so-called so external motivation. But the important thing is here the intrinsic motivation as, you, as we, we talk about. But uh, when it comes to sustainability, we have more hours now to spend with the students to take care of them. And I think we need to build this platform together also with the society. I mean, we, we would like to, 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 to look at it from the uh, helicopter perspective. What is, how, how do we, if we backcast our students 10 years from now, we need them to be sustainable. And we also need to start to discuss this with them because we need to add this into the curricula. So yes, the Agenda 2030 and the inner motivation is uh, key here, I think. I yeah. really like you mentioned identity there. Like my research primarily focuses on performers, on, on people who suffer from this neurological disorder, musicians, not specific focal dystonia. And then one of my findings is actually linking these, uh, this problem to a very rigid identity. Like I, this is all I have. This is what I absolutely have to do. And I have to be the very best at this. And if I don't have this, I don't have anything. And I recently read an article looking at young athletes especially in, in types of sports who like they have to start training very early. If you want to be a gymnast, you have time until you're 20. And then if you're 22, you're too old to become like a female gymnast. Like there is a time like window when you can, you know, go to the Olympic games. And it's a very similar, like some kids start to learn the violin, the piano age four or five. Mm. So when you, sort of like prescribe this kind of now you're you have to focus on this and they their identity really just like narrows in and only focuses on that one thing and it's also very unhealthy for the psychological development mm -hmm. so when thinking about teaching young people it's I think it's also very important to have several different things going on at the same time do some sports go hiking play table tennis go out with your friends and then practice the piano and then that kind of mentality could be carried over, even if someone like plans to be a professional performer and leave some space for themselves and other activities throughout the day, that would lead to a less rigid identity, which probably would lead to a better psychological health. Mm -hmm. So, And I think this is super important, the thing you share now, because we have also heard from our students that uh, we sort of uh, increase their self-image when they are under 10. You hear that you are so fantastic. But then all of a sudden, when you turn out to be 14, 15, uh, there is so many others that are as good as you are. And we need also to find a vocabulary to uh, target the identity of uh, that uh, person who is uh, good enough and half good enough identities. We need to talk about the half, there is no such thing as per, 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 perfection. perfection. Uh, we, have, we have a sort of a vocabulary when they are under 10, talking about perfectionism and, and, and those. We need to, to also be aware of how we explain things and also to relate it to sustainable new identity. What is a sustainable identity for a person who is 10 years old and uh, uh, and, and have have the whole life in, in in front of him her so yes absolutely you target something super important here yeah. Karen can I are you are you wanting to come in I can't quite tell yeah, no I was I was thinking about that sort of the, the perfectionist tendencies which is which is really problematic actually for for you know for emotional well-being and mental health 
um, later. Um, I was also thinking about some of the more general lessons for um, well-being and happiness and mental health and that that sort of you know continuum. Um, uh, and I haven't really heard any of you talking about the sort of the volunteering and the um, you know because one of the one of the key things you can do to make yourself feel good is to kind of help others and I know this is a very motherhood and apple pie thing to say but but it is true and it's and it's evidence based and I was just wondering about the um, you know the community elements of music um, I'm also interested in the, um, the the difference between the the sort of psychological um, well-being of a, a soloist, um, I can't remember who was describing this, but traveling around working with different people all the time, and that team player um, person in an ensemble or in a, in a, in a band or in a, in a, in a big orchestra um, seems to me a really interesting um, different set of pressures there. So I, I'm just interested in your reflections on both of those things. I can see that Naomi was jumping to come in. So uh, Naomi, over to you. I can't tell what's on everyone's screen, but um, <laughs> I think that's really interesting, Karen. And the, the five ways to well-being, including give, um, was once something I embedded in the Musician's Health and Wellness module that I did. And I think that is really important, but it's also something to, particularly educators, I think often give a bit too much um, in terms of putting their own health at risk to promote the health and wellness of their pupils. Um, we're certainly seeing that across higher education at the moment in terms of staff burnout. Um, so I think that there is something there about how you give and giving responsibly and acknowledging that in, in modeling we, and, and showing how to give support, how to give in different ways, how to volunteer, it's shown in that sustainability way that Eva, Eva's been speaking about. So giving in different directions, as Anna has said, giving in a sustainable way and remembering that we can't pour from an empty cup. But um, I really think that you're right that there are so many lessons from health psychology, public health, behavior change that we need to be implementing because as Anna said earlier, these things can change, but we need the structure and the structure exists. Lessons in both directions, Naomi. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm really interested to think about some of the things that musicians um, go through um, and 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 the decisions that that you guys make that have more general lessons for for pu public health as well. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, you, you can you know no doubt learn from from public health and and behaviour change, but I think you can lead some of this as well. And one of the things that um, it's slightly off topic, so I can bring this back, or, or Karen, if you if you'd like me to. Um, yeah, just just park this one. But I was thinking about the the, the precarity of of musicians' lives as well, which I'm surprised not to have heard from you. And I, I suppose it's sort of I'm, I'm an economist by training. I was thinking about the sort of financial precarious state of many musicians, um, and I'm I'm surprised that that hasn't turned up in in your discussions. And and what I was thinking about with regard to that and more general lessons is how do musicians cope with this? slightly precarious lifestyle at least when you're not you know at the absolute top of the, the tree um and what what does society need to learn from that in a situation where increasingly people are in precarious jobs you know the the gig the gig economy even the word is 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 has come from music so i'm interested in in some of your views on that one too but perhaps that's off theme karen apologies well, I'm just I'm just sort of mindful of time, but I think it's absolutely <laughs> at the heart of this. And I think what the pandemic has shown us is exactly how precarious um, this industry is that we're talking about. And I think, you know, we've been talking a lot about change at educational levels and about the responsibilities that we have as musicians and music students and educators and parents and members of a community. But there are some systemic larger scale issues with the way that the arts are funded and um, the amount of support that's available for musicians and I mean support in the broadest sense not just kind of support for health although you know one of the things I would have liked to discuss with you all but sadly I think we're out of time is about where that support comes from because of course the topic of today is about self-care but that needs to originate somewhere and I think there's some an amazing lack of people talking about how they look after themselves. You know, where are the role models? Where are the people promoting these healthy behaviours in the industry? So, you know, I think there's a piece of work that the industry could do collectively. And I think the messages I think I've heard from each of our speakers today is about it's a collective endeavour. 
the responsibility doesn't sit on the shoulders of just educators or the musicians. It's a kind of collective effort. But I think what we're hearing is that this is really important for not just our musicians, but for the health of the nation, because we know how important music is for the nation's health and well-being and kind of cultural uh, kind of community and uh, richness. So I think I'm going to have to end there. Very, very sadly, it's been fascinating. And I'm really hoping that our paths may cross the game to continue these discussions, because I think it's a really rich area for um, avenue. So uh, for exploration, sorry. So I'd like again to thank our speakers today, Anna Datari, Naomi Norton, Ava Boyna Horvitz and David Tyreen and uh, panel member Karen Bloor as well. Thank you for your contributions. Um, the recording is going to be available on the festival YouTube channel and you can access it through the watch again feature. Thank you very much everybody and have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.